Welcome everybody. So there will be two hours of classes and then uh, one hour of, um, of exercises, except this week where, because we didn't have a lecture yet, we don't have a, a TA. Okay, so, so what I want to discuss during this, um, this class is uh, the theory of geometric representation for, for spin models. So lattice spin models are models that have been introduced to model, I mean, to discretize quantum and Euclidean field theory. So I'm not sure I'm going to have time to discuss this connection between the lattice spin models and this uh, quantum field theory. Maybe at the end if I have a little bit of time. But um, you're going to see that it's basically the same object except that here we work in the discrete level. So basically our random variables or our variables in general are sitting on a lattice. So these, these lattice spin models, they, they go back far, like maybe early uh, 20th century, something like that. And uh, at the time, the, the approach that was standard to, to try to do something on these models was very analytical. We were, I mean, people were using analysis to try to study these models. But over the years, so, I mean, there, there were a lot of successes. We will see some of them. But over the year, it appeared that there is an alternative approach, which is more geometric, and which has many advantages. In particular, because the, analysis, the analytical approach is very dependent on the detail of your model. And if you modify it a little bit, sometimes what you can easily prove for one model, and that you would like to prove for a model that behaves exactly the same, would be completely impossible approaching, I mean, if you use the, the analytical approach. And um, this geometrical approach ba is based on, on a very simple idea. You will see that the main object of interest in, in lattice spin models is uh, the notion of, of correlation between variables. And the idea of the geometrical approach is to restate, to translate this geometrical, I mean, this um, uh, correlation between, uh, between uh, variables into geometric uh, properties of a random subgraph of ZD, what we will call a percolation model. And when you work with these percolation models, then you can study the intersection probabilities of such path. There, exists, there is much more techniques, much more robust techniques to study this type of models. And that's what I'm going to try to advertise here. So we are going to discuss these spin models, but mostly this geometrical representation and what they imply for the underlying spin model. OK, so there will be many connections, in particular, to uh, the class of Yvon, and in the second term with the class of, uh, for instance, Stas. OK, uh, you can interrupt me, ask questions, and so on. I like it when it's lively, and I cannot do it myself. So <laughs> please ask, and uh, just don't scream at me. That's all. I react very poorly. OK, chapter one is so it's going to be organized like that. So first chapter, which is going to be basically today, it's going to be a very short chapter, is going to tell you a little bit what the lattice spin model is. I'm not going to prove anything, but I want to define what it is, give you examples of lattice spin models. And uh, more importantly, I want to kind of give you a state of the art of what are the very big questions in the area and what are uh, the things that have been solved. This is going to be both uh, motivation and an overview, because then what we are going to do in the next uh, classes will be actually to study, to try to prove some of these results that I would have mentioned in this first class. And. Um, because so this geometrical representation, they are all uh, what we call percolation models. I'm going to start then by the simplest of the percolation model you can imagine, which is Bernoulli percolation. So I'm going to give you a crash course on Bernoulli percolation. Some people had a class last year. Uh, this is going to be much faster. And it's going to be targeted to a few specific results, which, which are the ones that we will use or that we will generalize for, for more. Uh, uh, difficult uh, percolation models. And then, so that will be the second chapter, then we will, uh, in fact, study three different uh, representations in three different chapters and try to tell you a little bit more about them. So chapter one, that's the introduction somehow. 
and it's just, well, lattice spin models. What is it? And I'm going to try something like that. OK, so as the name suggests, the lattice spin model is on a lattice. This is, I'm not going to like this thing. OK, go there. So I will, I will restrict myself to ZD. OK, we, you can do on more general lattices, but it's going to be ZD, so the vertices and the set of edges of a graph, I will always denote it like that, so set of vertices. The set of vertices is just ZD, okay? So it's integer n1, nd, or ni and z. And the edges are just the couples. Oh, actually, the set like that, where you have x minus y uh, equal 1. Okay, so these are the nearest neighbors. So you only put edges between nearest neighbors. Then uh, I will always, when I look at the graph G, I will not always write it, but it will always be a subgraph of ZD. And because it's going to be simple when there is no space for confusion, this I will just identify it with Z, with G. Okay, so the set of vertices with the set of, I mean, with the graph itself. A few more notations and then we can start. The boundary of G is going to be the set of X in G such that there exists Y in ZD minus G such that uh, X is a neighbor of Y. So what I'm going to write here because it's going to be simple. Simple is this means x, y is an edge. OK? So this, this is a set of vertices in your graph which have at least one neighbor outside of your graph. OK? So we will call this is an inner vertex boundary. And, uh, well, two more notations. Lambda n will always denote just the box minus n, n to the d. OK, so it's a box of size n. And the last thing that I want to denote is just z2. We call it the square lattice. OK, so these were the basic notation. Nothing spectacular there, but like that we agree with uh, basic notation. And, 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 and last thing, zero, I identify with zero, zero. So it's just the origin of ZT. Okay. So there, that was the notation. Now let's, let's start by some definitions. Definitions, basically the, what we call the Gibbs formalism. Okay. So first thing, so we have our lattice. Let's say it's Z2. On every vertex of your lattice, there's going to be a random variable, sigma x, which is going to be called a spin. So first thing, the spin space, so this random variable, is going to take value in a, just a subset omega of r to some uh, power nu, OK? Nu has nothing to do with d. There will be d will be the dimension of my lattice nu will be the dimension of my uh, spin space, OK? I'm going to give very specific example. Don't worry about that. And the spin configuration say on a, on a graph G is going to just be 
sigma, it's going to be a set of sigma x, x in G. So on every vertex of your graph, you put a spin. And it's just an element of omega. And here, I'm going to just specify v of g. I really want you here, it's v of g. At this point, be, be very careful that the random variables, they are lying on the vertices. So for every element, uh, for every vertex, you put a uh, random variable taking value in, in omega. And sigma x is called the spin at x. OK. So as I said, I'm going to take subgraph of ZD. And it's going to be very important that my graph, I see it as lying inside ZD. So in addition to the spin configuration on G, I'm going to specify what is going on outside of my graph. So I'm going to introduce the notion of boundary condition. So the boundary condition on G, it's simply going to be a configuration tau in omega of V of ZD minus V of G. So outside, I specify a spin for every vertex which is not in my graph. OK? Condition. So now we have a spin configuration. We have what is outside. We need to tell you what is the energy of a configuration. So the Hamiltonian, or the energy of configuration, of sigma, is going to be the following. So h tau of sigma, it depends I mean, with boundary condition tau, it's going to be the following. It's going to be minus the sum for every edge x neighbor of y. Or in general, I'm not sure. Yeah, let's take any x and y, actually, of the following. So I'm going to look at the scalar product between sigma x and sigma y. So you agree, I mean, omega is a subset of r to the nu, so I have a scalar product, natural scalar product. And I look at the scalar product between the two, except that I introduce a jxy. So jxy is just a family, the family of coupling constants. on uh, ZD squared. So for every pair of elements in ZD, I, I um, associate uh, JXY, which is going to be, in general, JXY is in R. So I do like that, except that I want to add the fact that I also take care of elements which are not in G. But when I do that, you see that I cannot take the scalar product of sigma x with sigma y, because when I'm outside of G, I don't have sigma y. But I have tau y. So I take this, this thing. OK? So just intuitively now, what does it mean? Um, imagine that I'm taking jxy to be positive. Because in fact, that's what I'm going to always do. If jxy is positive, then this Hamiltonian is small when sigma x and sigma y are aligned, as aligned as possible. OK? So this thing, h tau, is favoring uh, configurations for which spins are aligned. So that's what we are going to call a ferromagnetic model. 
I'm going to explain what is the connection to ferromagnetism in a minute when I will do the examples. By the way, um, I'm going to also introduce edge free of a configuration sigma, and it's just the first part here. It is somehow when I'm not at all taking care about what is going on outside my graph. Okay? It's going to be sometime useful, not so often, but sometime useful. And I should maybe say that this depends on the graph G. Okay, so we have an Hamiltonian. Imagine this as an energy, really. And the energy is lower when you have more spins that are aligned. So now what do you want to do? You want to introduce a probability measure, which is taking into account the fact that configuration with lower energy are more likely to occur, right? And there is a standard way to do that, which goes back to Botsman, and which says the following, so Gibbs measure. So let G be a subgraph of ZD. Let tau be a boundary condition on G. You should really interrupt me if I go too fast, or if I go too slow, or if it's not clear, if I don't write properly, if I write properly. Well, you are allowed to interrupt me, OK? Let G tau be a boundary condition on G. And um, well, today it's mostly definition, so it's not going to be. Let's take beta positive. And now I'm going to define the Gibbs measure on G. So let, consider the following measure. Uh, well, I went a little bit fast here. No, let's go there. The following measure, I'm going to go there. So what I'm going to first explain is there is a measure, there is a first measure, which is not so interesting, which is just taking spins completely independently, not connecting them at all with each other. Well, notice that it's not completely obvious how you do that, because in order to take spin independently, what you would like to do is you want to take your space omega and take a measure, take one guy, I mean, according to some measure on this space omega. So what I need is a measure on omega. So I will always give myself d sigma 0 to be just a measure on omega. I'm going to give you examples. Think if, the, if omega is finite, you're just going to take the uniform measure on this thing, the discrete measure. If omega is r, you are going to take just the Lebesgue measure or something like that. Actually, you don't even really need the measure to be a probability measure. So take a measure on omega and define this sigma to be just the product measure for every x in g of d sigma x, where d sigma x is just a copy of d, of d sigma 0. So this is what? This is a measure which takes uniformly for every vertex in your graph you take one spin according to the measure d sigma 0, basically. OK? Is it clear for everybody? So this is a product measure. Think if you take, I mean, it's r to the g. I mean, it's, it's a Lebesgue me me measure for every vertex of your graph if, for instance, you take omega to be r. Now. The measure that I'm really interested in is not a measure where everybody is taken uniformly, right? It's a measure which is penalizing by the energy. So I'm going to define mu g tau beta. And if I want to define a measure, I need to tell you what it does on measurable functions. So if I take a measurable function f, it's going to do the following. First, there's going to be a normalizing, oh, let's start on, on the top. So it's going to be the integral on omega to the v of g. So I have a measure on omega to the v of g. It's just d sigma of f of sigma. OK, so f is a function from omega to the v of g into, say, r. 
So this will be exactly taking the expectation with respect to the measure d sigma itself. But I don't want to do that. I want to penalize by the energy. So I'm going to put an exponential of minus beta times the energy of the configuration. So you see now, the higher the energy, the lower the weight in the measure. If I do that, it's not a probability measure. So I'm going to renormalize. In such a way, now I renormalize in such a way that when I take the expectation of 1, when I look at the mass of the measure, I just get 1. Okay? So this is called the partition function. You are going to look and probably encounter that several times in the class of EVO. Partition function of your graph, of your measure. OK, so this is now, this gives me a way of sampling randomly a configuration in my graph. What do I want to add on that? I'm sorry, this is like a bunch of definitions, but well, we need to start by that. And of course, you can take tau to be free if you want to define the measure with free boundary conditions. Last definition. It's going to be the following, that, um, that I'm always going to look at jxy positive. So if jxy is positive for every xy, we say that the model is ferromagnetic. And I'm going to allow, I mean, most of the cases, I'm actually going to restrict even more. I'm going to say that if jxy is positive if and only if x is a neighbor of y, then we say that the model is nearest neighbor. And uh, trust me, it's already, I mean, It's already sufficiently complicated like that. So we are going to always look at nearest neighbor. And in fact, in the case of the nearest neighbor, I'm even going to just set jxy equal 1 for every x neighbor of y. So I'm not even going to take, a priori, I could take different coupling constants depending on the neighbors. I'm always going to do that. And you see that here, you are in a context where actually the coupling constants are translational invariant. Right? And this is something that we always assume, basically, because it comes back, uh, I mean, it goes back to the fact that your quantum field theory or your uh, Euclidean field theory is in a space which is homogeneous, which most of the time is the case. So we are going to also assume that jxy anyway is a j of x minus 1. But since anyway, I'm going to restrict to this case, uh, this falls down immediately. So our, our In this context, I'm, at the end, when I write this thing, it's just going to be minus the sum of sigma x, sigma y, plus, well, let's write it for the free, for x neighbors of y. Okay? I'm always going to work with that, except in the last chapter, but I will go back to this later. Okay, it's a sufficiently rich uh, theory like that. Good. Are there questions on the definitions? I cannot believe I'm that clear. So <laughs> there must be at least one person lost, right? No? Nobody? Maybe one thing. Ah. Uh, yeah. You say when every coupling constant is positive, the model is ferromagnetic. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't mean there is a phase transition or something like that. Is no, ferromagnetic is going to mean that uh, the spins want to be aligned with each other. If you take jxy to be negative, then you have spin that gets, starts to, be, to want to be disaligned. And, um, and this can make, I mean, there are very interesting things, for instance, in spin glasses or things like that, where you assume this. 
But then you get to a phenomena, there is one phenomena that occurs, which is not present in the ferromagnetic models, which is that you cannot always, I mean, so let's see if this is, if this guy is plus, this guy, oh, so let's take a trivalent graph. If this guy is plus, this guy wants to be minus, because if, say if you take plus or minus spins, and this guy now cannot be, I mean, it's going to be necessarily frustrated somehow cannot be uh, in the best position ever. And this, is, uh, this frustration between spins is a specific property of anti-ferromagnetic models, which make them very different from the ferromagnetic models. So from this point of view, the theory is completely different. So we are going to restrict ourselves to ferromagnetic. And uh, another thing, that's not really the definitions, but yeah. uh, the space of state you took before was something like R with a certain power. Yeah. So it's pretty wild. Uh, what yeah. is the aim uh, with such a model? I mean, you're not going to... I'm going to, I'm going to, so then maybe the examples are going to answer a little bit this question. Okay, because uh, well, last year I saw that if the condition is so wild, you may not find a measure on all set D. So the yeah, but here, I mean, most of the times you are going to take omega to be compact anyway, except okay. when it's R. And it's compact, you can take the R it's measure. It's included in R, but it's not R entirely. It's going to be for No, no, it's included in R to the new. Okay. I mean, it's not, uh, not uh, full space. Okay, so yeah, fine. not necessarily. Yes. Thank you. Good question. Okay, so examples. <laughs> Are we sending over like, um, like, are we sending over edges or are we sending over this vertex and this vertex? Because from this vertices, side, vertices. That's very important. Now, so far, and it's going to be completely different, completely different for the percolation model. The percolation model will be on edges, but here it's on vertices. So, are we? No, I mean, um, is the coupling like from this? It looks like the coupling constant between two points in the graph is two. And the coupling constant between a point on the graph and something outside is a point. Ah, that's your question. Yeah. Ah. Uh because -huh. each each edge is seven points. Uh, yeah. If they're over the graph, they're outside. Okay. Yeah, it's not going to be relevant for what I'm going to present, but indeed you're you're right. Okay. Good. We can do like that. Good question. Very well. Was I smarter here? I was smarter here. OK. But when you speak about nearest neighbor, you mean really positive strictly or different from uh, the other? So I mean, now, eh, I mean strictly positive if and only if you are neighbors. So if you are not neighbors, it's 0. If you are neighbors, it's strictly positive. Then, then yeah. it cannot be negative. No, 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 no. I mean, I'm just restricting. Mean, it could be, but here I'm just restricting to that anyway. I mean, I'm going to take. I'm taking subspecies of what is before every single time. Okay, examples. So the first and maybe one of the most important example is a model that you heard about already. Probably it's the Ising model. So the Ising model. I need to tell you what omega is, and it's going to be minus one one. I need to tell you what d sigma 0 is, and it's just a counting measure. So counting measure here just means that when you take your integral, you are just doing the sum. That's all. The sum on configurations. OK, so this model was not introduced by Ising, but by Lenz. So model introduced by Lenz. which was uh, Ising advisor uh, in the 1920s. And what Ising did in this thing was to prove that it has a phase transition, uh, that it doesn't have a phase transition, no phase transition, in 1D, in one dimension, on ZD. So because I, I believe you are extremely strong, you are going to do uh, easing a PhD thesis in a more general case in your uh, exercise for next week. So that's his entire uh, PhD thesis. And so the goal was what? The goal was to try to model Curie temperature. So Curie's temperature is the following. <laughs> Q 
sure is the husband this time. Uh, this co I mean, made the following experiment. You take uh, iron at the, the end of a stick where you can rotate like that. So this moves. And you put a bigger uh, an ament here. So ament. I'm sure it's not written like that in a, a magnet. That's why. Yeah, I was thinking that doesn't sound English. Yeah, that's my job. I use this word every two weeks, but that's OK. Uh, magnet. So at room temperature, the thing is actually attracted by the magnet. No? The magnet induces a magnetic field on this uh, thing. It gets attracted. Now if you have uh, a big lighter, but very big, like that, and you, uh, you make the iron uh, hotter above a certain temperature, which is called the Curie temperature, Tc, the iron loses its uh, magnetization. It goes back, the, the bar goes back to vertical. You remove, the, you remove the lighter, the things cool down and get attracted again as soon as it goes below this temperature. So actually, you need really a very big lighter if you want to do it with iron, because you need to go above 800 uh, degrees. But with some, uh, with some um, mixture of, uh, of metals, you can actually get this phenomena above, like I mean, around 40 degrees or things like that. So it can happen at different temperatures depending on the metal, but it always happens. There is this phase transition between a, a magnetic uh, phase and a non-magnetic phase where you are not attracted. So the goal of Lenz was to say, OK, how do I model this thing? Well, what I do is that I imagine that my iron, which is in 3D, is, I mean, each atom in my iron is like a small magnet with a north and a south pole. If you put two magnets near to each other, the north pole of one is attracted by the south pole of the other one. So you are going to get that the magnets, I mean, that the small uh, magnets want to be aligned with each other. OK? But at the same time, there is room, I mean, there is a temperature. So there is excitation in your model. So not all the magnets are going to get aligned perfectly. At zero temperature, they would, but not at higher temperature because of the excitation due to temperature. So these guys, sometimes, they are in the other direction. But one thing which is important that basically your big iron bar is going to be magnetized if a large majority of, uh, I mean, just more than a majority of the, the small atoms are pointing in one direction. OK? If you have, say, two thirds of the guys that are pointing in one direction, you are magnetized. So what does this huge magnet do, in fact? This huge magnet is just doing one thing. It's forcing the guys on the boundary. They really feel that they are on the boundary. And they want to be aligned with this, this huge north or south pole that is here. So all the guys on the boundary are going to be aligned with the magnet. So what does it, I mean, how can I translate it in terms of boundary condition? It boils down to saying that the boundary conditions are plus. Say. I'm forcing all the guys on the boundary of my graph to be aligned in one direction. So let's say tau equal plus. And now what do I want to know? I want to know if inside most of the guys are aligned with this plus. So I want basically to look at the following quantity, which I'm going to call m of my graph, like magnetization. And it's the sum of, well, sigma x. And I want to know whether it's plus or not. Okay. So it's going to be magnetized if when I take the measure at g beta with plus boundary condition of m of g, if this is going to be, say, for instance, larger than 1 half plus epsilon, I mean, so this is centered, so larger than epsilon times the size of your graph. OK? So this is a way of saying, OK, if I have this, I'm magnetized. If I don't, magnetize. 
Okay? And imagine of, I mean, this is every atom of your graph. So imagine a huge graph, basically ZD. Imagine that you send the boundary condition to infinity. Am, am I, in average, a line with a plus? Do I remember that there were plus boundary condition at infinity or not? And the question that Lenz asked to Ising was, OK, 3D is maybe difficult. The geometry of your underlying graph is difficult. Do it on Z. Put plus on both sides. And look here, what is the average magnetization? And what is improved is that whatever the temperature, so beta can be understood, I should have said that, beta can be understood as an inverse temperature. You could, I could write 1 over t. And t will really be what we mean, I mean, what we call temperature. So is improved that whatever beta, there is never magnetization. There is no phase transition. And so that's a very simple exercise that you are going to do for next week. Actually, you are going to do it for the POTS model, which is a slightly more general model. But the beauty of what, what Ising did is that not only did he do only that during his PhD, but he also predicted that this happens in any dimension. There is never phase transition. Ising is not a good model for magnetization because it doesn't, in 3D, you should have a phase transition, right? So, then, this asks for generalization of your model. And that's where it becomes interesting to take more general things. So we are going to see a, a little bit uh, later that there is a natural generalization, which is to ask that your spin, for instance, is on a three-dimensional sphere. Because, in fact, the orientation of your magnet has no reason to be just there or there. It could actually point in any direction. So this would already be a slightly more natural uh, model. But let's first do a uh, slightly more uh, uh, simple, I mean, slightly simpler models with the POTS model. I don't know why I did that. But. So second model, POTS model. So in the POTS model, omega is just going to be, so what I want is, I want a Q state model. I want that the spin can take Q different values. And I would like that sigma x, sigma y is going to be equal to, say, 1 if sigma x is equal to sigma y. And just another value if they are different, but always the same value. So if I take two spins, I can always just indeed, so this is 0. If I take plus 1 and minus 1, I indeed have the property that if sigma x, sigma y is equal to 1 if they are equal, and just minus 1 if they are not equal. If I want three spins, I can take the triangular, an equilateral triangle like that. And here I'm going to have that the scalar product is 1 if uh, they are equal, and minus 1 half if they are different. And in general, if you take a polyhedron in dimension uh, mu minus, uh, q minus 1, I guess. You can always take omega included in r to the q minus 1, such that for every a and b in omega, if I do sigma, uh, if I do the scalar product of a and b, I get 1 if a is equal to b, and minus 1 over q minus 1 if a is not equal to b. So I let you think about that, but you can always find a space like that, omega. And now, and this, and now I take just the counting measure. On omega, and I have a model now with a Gibbs measure, and this is called the Potts model. The Potts model has not been introduced by Potts. That would be too easy again. So the model was introduced by its advisor again. So model introduced by Dombe and studied by Potts in his, uh, in his PhD. And that was actually a very good PhD. So there, no problem with that. Actually, he's in completely left academia and realized uh, 30 years later that he was uh, one of the most cited names in, uh, in, uh, in math or physics, for what matters. Q equal 2 is what? This is the Ising model, OK? So Q equal 2 
And this was introduced in the 40s, I guess, something like that. Let me not tell you something wrong. No, 50s, 52. And Q equal 2 is just the easing model. So it's a generalization to Q state of the easing model. It's actually not a very good model for magnetism, for what matters, but it is a very nice model for some uh, solid matter physics, actually, where um, the, I mean, molecules in, uh, in, uh, in, your, um, in your solid have a tendency to take different directions. So this is actually a very good model for that. And you are going to see that mathematically this is a beautiful model that displays very different behavior depending on the number of colors, in fact, on Q. So just for the intuition, when I write the Hamiltonian, let's say with free boundary condition of sigma, so it's minus sum of uh, sigma x, sigma y for x and y. OK, so let's uh, for x neighbor of y. And here I mean that uh, for, for edges. Um, this you can rewrite if you think about it. This quantity is what? It's 1 minus uh, delta sigma x not equal to sigma y, and I need to put, I mean, or I should write rather like that, delta of sigma x equal to sigma y minus um, something. OK, I'm going to humiliate myself here. Uh, up, and so therefore, when this, guy is, uh, this, this is 1, I need to multiply. OK. Well, let's do it quietly. I want to write it just in terms of delta. So there is going to be, um, so <laughs> I want to solve this thing equal 1 or minus 1. The first one who gets it gets a candy. Uh, OK. So when this is equal to 0, I want alpha beta equal 1 over q minus 1. And I want alpha times 1 minus beta equal 1. I don't think I solve my problem right now. So alpha is 1 plus, uh, so it's q over q minus 1. And beta is therefore 1 over q. Are you agreeing with that? So this is minus q over q minus, I mean, plus q, uh, minus, sorry. Something like that. The important thing is the following. You are take, you are enormous, there is absolutely no way this is the right answer, but that's okay. Uh, no, there is still the minus, right? I don't know why I removed it. Um, the important thing is that this is a constant that doesn't depend on the configuration. Okay? So when you do it in the numerator and the denominator, this thing is going to cancel anyway. So you can just, you know, the energy, if you just change the energy by a constant for everybody, you don't change at all. The, uh, that's very nice, thanks. You don't change at all the, your probability measure. So what I'm really doing for this guy is just I'm counting how many guys are agreeing, how, how many neighbors are agreeing, OK? So that's another way of just saying, so that's why usually we say, OK, there are Q colors. So the intuition is that there are Q colors. And that's just a model that is favoring the fact that you want uh, neighbors to have similar colors. OK? So this was the POTS model. Let's do a 15 minutes break, and then we carry on with other examples. OK, third model then. So the third model, we are not really going to be studying it. But I mentioned it because it exhibits an interesting behavior that I will mention later on. So the clock model. So the clock model, simply omega, is the Q roots of unity. 
And this sigma 0 is just a counting measure. So be careful. It's not like um, the Q state POTS model, right? It's not. There are Q states. For Q equal 2 and 3, it is the same model, in fact. But notice that two spins that are different, here, they may have different scalar products. So in fact, it's more aligned somehow. You have, I mean, the spins that are, I mean, if you take a spin and you look at the other spins, they don't play symmetric roles. So be careful, it's not the same. Different from pots for Q larger or equal to 4. And it's really different. It will exhibit different behavior. Then uh, let's now go, get to continuous spin. So we are going to study, for instance, the ON model. So the ON model, and that's going to be an example in R n plus 1, R n minus 1. So omega is be the n is going to be the n-dimensional sphere. The set of x1, xn, where um, x equal x1, xn, where x, I mean, the Euclidean norm is equal to 1. And this is also a generalization of the Ising model, if you think about it. n equal 1 is just the Ising model. In fact, n equal 2 and n equal 3 also have names, and I'm going to mention it quickly. So n equal 2 is called the xy model, and n equal 3 is called the Heisenberg model. And this, so you already heard Heisenberg, the name Heisenberg in uh, um, quantum field theory. Sorry? Can, uh, can you repeat what you Q? Uh, what's, uh, what's, what's the spin space in the clock model? Sorry. Ah, you could, uh, the Q root of unity. Sorry. Okay. I should have said that. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> okay, so Heisenberg, in fact, introduced his model in dimension two a quantum version of it, but I mean it has a similar behavior, to try to prove that there is a phase transition. That, that I mean, you can create, you see, it, it is a natural model for spins in a, for a magnetic field because simply for a magnet because just your spin is pointing in one direction in space. So he introduced that uh, to model uh, magnets. Unfortunately for him, somehow uh, faith was uh, against him. In dimension two, the Ising model, contrary to what Ising proved, I mean, uh, conjecture, has a phase transition. The Heisenberg model doesn't. <laughs> so that was a, a poor choice, but in fact, the Heisenberg model, so in Heisenberg model, in dimension three, I mean, dimension two and three, is related to a very important phenomena in physics, which, which is called Anderson localization. So it's related, not very strongly. They are, it's more of, a, I mean, it should have the same behavior to uh, what we call Anderson localization, which is related. I mean, Anderson localization is a question of whether, whether uh, a metal is going to conduct or block uh, currents. And it's a very important phenomenon. Anderson got the, uh, got the Nobel Prize for that. And it's one of the biggest questions in mathematics to prove rigorously that you have uh, localization in the model in dimension uh, uh, two, and uh, that you have a localization at low temperature and delocalization in higher dimension, so in dimension three in particular. It's related to superconductivity? Or so, not to superconductivity, no. just to uh, it's insulator or conductor. It's not so related to superconductivity. And uh, if you want a Fields medal for those who really have you know, long teeth, prove Anderson localization or delocalization, this I can guarantee you will get it. I cannot guarantee you are going to solve it, though, but <laughs> yeah. So 
once again, you see you change a little bit the spin, uh, the spin space, you get a different model. You are going to see I'm going to draw a big picture with a different possible behavior. You get completely different behavior. Okay? So it's very, the spin space is extremely important and that's also where the richness of this uh, theory comes from. Uh, very well. So the model was introduced, the general model was introduced by Stanley in 68. Okay. Um, let's carry on with new models. There is a model that maybe you heard already in, uh, in, um, in Yvonne's class, or if you didn't yet, you are going to hear very soon, which is a discrete Gaussian free field. what we call GFF, where the GFF is also a spin model, even though it's not presented as a spin model usually. So here, omega, the spin space, is going to be R. So on every vertex of your graph, you're going to be a uh, real value uh, vari variable. And uh, d sigma 0 this time is going to be Gaussian. So it's going to be exponential of minus, so let me see what renormalization I put, sigma 0 squared over 2, divided by square 2 pi, d, sigma, uh, d lambda uh, 0, which this is just Lebesgue. Okay, so you t each guy, if you would not uh, make any interaction between them, is just Gaussian. Okay, Gaussian random variables. But now, you add this uh, this Hamiltonian, and you get a new field of Gaussian random variables, which is called the Gaussian free field. So let me just mention that, so you should be careful when you take free boundary, well, okay. This guy, of function f, so you can write it in terms of the, of the Hamiltonian I described, but it's not usually what is done. Usually, the Gaussian free field is written a little bit differently. So, if you look at the definition I introduced and you plug in the fact that you take a Gaussian variable here, what you're going to see is that, in fact, this thing is equal to the following ratio. It's the integral of f of sigma exponential of minus an energy. I'm going to... So, usually, the point is that people just write it in terms of the Lebesgue measure, not in terms of this, this measure. And when you write it in terms of the Lebesgue measure, here you don't get the energy that I mentioned because you need to plug this thing in uh, your exponential. But you get something which is not ugly at all. Which is called, this thing is called the Dirichlet energy. And when you write it properly, this guy, I mean, let me try, I think it's going to be equal to beta over 2, sum on the edges of sigma x minus sigma y squared. So this is usually what you will see when you will see the definition of the GFF. Plus, there is a 1 half minus d beta times the sum of the sigma x squared for x in g. Okay, so what I just did here is that I put this guy in the exponential and I just turn things around, I get that. You, you see that the sigma x, sigma y come from the cross product here. Um, so here you notice that there is something interesting happening which is that if 2d beta is equal to 1, then the second term disappears. And that's what we call the massless GFF. It's a massless GFF. If 2d beta is smaller than 1, 
then this guy is not going to be zero. It's going to be, in fact, uh, positive. And it's telling you, you see there is a minus here, it's kind of pushing sigma to be close to zero. You know, because this guy is saying, okay, big squares are bad for you. Here, this is only controlling the difference, by the way. You see, I was careful. Here, if I define it with free boundary conditions, say, then for the massless model, I have a problem because this is only taking care of the difference. So the model is not really defined. But in the mass, in the mass uh, version, so this is a massive GFF, this term is pushing guys to be close to the origin, close to zero. And if 2d beta is larger than 1, so then it becomes catastrophic because this becomes negative. So then it's pushing guys to be large. So this is actually not even convergent. So you cannot define it. In this case, it's not defined. <laughs> OK? So you have different behavior with respect to this. I must say, I mean, the discrete GFF, you don't really see it as a spin model in the terms. You never, ne never really look at this energy. It's not so interesting. You, I mean, at this uh, Hamiltonian. You always write it like that. But I want to mention it here just to tell you that it fits in the theory, because at some point when we are going to study the easing model, we are going to actually compare it to the GFF. And at first sight comes, I mean, it can come like a big surprise that you can compare a discrete model to a continuum one, which, by the way, if you never saw it is a spin model, doesn't really look like a spin model. But it's not so surprising. In fact, they all fit in the same family of models, if you think about it. And in fact, I'm going to go even farther than that, because I'm going to define the model that interpolates between the two. So there is what we call the phi 4D model. And this is ex yeah. What's that, what's that D? What's that D? Is it dimension? Yes, it's a dimension. Sorry. D will always be the dimension. I will try to be careful about that. Okay. Yeah? Because you see, here, is it dimension? the squares, you need to cancel the squares. You don't want the squares to be um, to appear here. And so that's why, I mean, because you have for every x, you have d neighbors, that's where this d is going to come back, uh, come uh, in the picture. Very good question. This beta doesn't really have an interpretation in terms of, usually, you, once again, you don't write it like that. So this beta doesn't really have an interpretation in terms of, of uh, the mass of uh, your model. So the 5-4-D lattice model, so it's possible that in the class of Marino, at some point you are going to look at 5-4-D theories in quantum field theory. Uh, and Euclidean field theory, maybe it's a, Here it's a discrete version of it. So what you do is you do almost the same. Basically, it's going to boil down to you look at that, but I'm going to add a sigma x to the 4. It's like, of the, like the simplest generalization you can do of, of, the easing mode, of the GFF. So you do like that. You do omega, I mean, you take omega to be r. But you take d sigma 0 to be exponential of minus, so I'm going to take a lot of latitude. I'm going to say it's minus a times sigma 0 squared. So this, is, this will be just Gaussian. But I'm going to add plus b sigma 0 to the 4, or minus b, maybe, d sigma 0, the d lambda 0. So I just add this term. It's kind of the simplest modification of the model you can imagine. And um, if you think about it, OK, a equal one half, b equals zero, you just get what? You just get the GFF. So this is GFF. OK, good. But now if you take a equal minus one, a equal minus two b, and you let a tends to infinity, what do you get? If you take a equal minus two b, 
here up to a constant 1 or something like that. This becomes the exponential of, I, I get 2b sigma 0 squared minus b sigma 0 to the 4. If I multiply all of this by, if I add something like uh, 1, uh, b, uh, minus b, which I can do, this is a constant, so I can always shift the energy by a constant. This is what? This is exponential of minus sigma 0 squared minus 1, and there is a b in front. Uh, so a is going to tend to minus infinity, sorry. You get that. So when b tends to infinity, sorry, squared, thank you, squared. When b tends to infinity, this thing is telling you, okay, sigma 0 squared must be equal to 1. So sigma 0 should be minus 1 or plus 1. And because I'm just taking the scalar product, this, I'm going to just recover the easing model. So the, on one hand, somehow, you get GFF. On the other end, you get easing. So here, you recover as a limit. So I, I'm not telling you exactly how you should take the limit and so on. It's, I mean, here, I'm not saying it's completely kosher. But in fact, you can make this completely rigorous as a limit the easing model. So it's not so surprising that uh, you can uh, compare the easing model to the GFF. And it goes even farther than that. It's, these 5,4-D models are extremely important in Euclidean uh, uh, field theory. And what I'm saying is that the easing model is kind of just a limit of that. And in fact, what is going to happen is that the easing model is going to have the same behavior as these 5,4-D models. So this becomes even more interesting that, in fact, if you can prove things on the easing model, you, give info, you provide information on this discrete version of a field theory. <coughs> and this provides a lot of insight into uh, field theory, Euclidean field theory. And that's exactly what I will mention at some point. We are going to prove that the easing model in dimension 4 and higher is, for instance, what we call a trivial theory. And one of the main questions in, in field theory is to prove, to provide in dimension 4. Because dimension 4, if you think about it, is 3 space, 1 time. So this is a physical uh, dimension in terms of field theory. Is to provide a field theory which is non-trivial. And for many years, physicists and mathematicians tried to construct one from a discrete approach by taking the simplest model they knew in the discrete approach, which was not trivial. The GFF is exactly what we call a trivial theory. So they took the first one, which is a non-trivial one, which is a 5,4-D. And they tried to prove it was non-trivial. They thought they were, it was non-trivial. So they worked a lot. There was all this constructive field theory. Princeton, Harvard were leading places there. There were dozens of people much smarter than all of us. I mean, at least me, who went there and solved all this. I mean, they tried very, very hard. And at some point, Michael Eisenman came and said, no, I mean, I think my, the easing model is trivial in dimension 4 and more. So it destroyed completely the field, because it was, or at least it destroyed one hope, which was to take the simplest non-trivial, I mean, that looks non-trivial model, and prove that it provides you uh, a Euclidean, non-trivial Euclidean field theory. So you are going to see, we are going to prove that it's uh, trivial in dimension 4 and more, this easing model. I will tell you what it means to be trivial and so on. But easing model gives you insight on, uh, quant on Euclidean field theory. And by the way, there is a transformation that tells you that Euclidean field theory and quantum field theory are related, if you are more interested in what is quantum. I think I went, I went way too far now. But that's OK. Let's go back to. That's very exciting. Is there a simple way to see that uh, taking a limit that you recover the easing model, or at least some motivation, or...? I, I mean, I, it's basically that. You just take b to infinity, and, and you really get the easing model. I mean, it's going to be the weak limit of your models like that. Okay. There is a notion of convergence of measures, and this is just a weak limit. Uh, there is nothing uh, hidden there. I'm not bullshitting you too much. OK. Let's do now um, phase. So let's discuss what we mean by phase transition in this model. So phase transition.
In, and I'm going to focus to two cases, which is POTS and ON models, just for ease of uh, presentation. I could do it for more general things, but here it's going to be a little bit simpler to present. So what do I mean by a phase transition? I mentioned it quickly for the easing model, but I want to be a little bit more careful about it. Now. So the reason why I take the ON and the POTS model is that here you have, you always have one which is in your, uh, your uh, spin space. So if you think about the easing model, when I look at the magnetization, when we go back a few steps to what I mentioned before with this magnetization, when you look at the magnetization, because of the, what we call the gauge theory, the gauge, gauge invariance of your model, that if you reverse all the spin, you get the same model. You can flip all the spins, you get the same model a priori. If you don't break the symmetry, the magnetization is obviously be zero, going to be zero. And for the POTS model, you also have a symmetry. Just you take the symmetries of your spin space. It gives you a gauge symmetry by basically commuting the, the colors. For the ON model, but we have all the rotations, all the rotation of the, of the n-dimensional sphere. So you want to break the symmetry to see something happening. Otherwise, your quantities are going to be zero. So what we are going to do is that from now on, we are going to always fix, except if I want to read something different, tau to be one. On the boundary of my, uh, and by this I mean tau x equal uh, one, zero, zero for every x. Meaning you take the unit vector in direction one, in the first direction in, uh, in r to the new, and you fix the boundary condition to be one for all these guys, to be this vector for everybody. So it breaks the symmetry. For the using model, it boils down to saying it's plus boundary conditions. And now we are going to introduce what we call the order parameter, m uh, star of beta. m star of beta is going to be just the limit when n tends to, when n tends to infinity of um, just what, what do I want to do? I want to see if the boundary conditions are impacting my measure inside. So I'm going to look at the spin at zero and see whether it's aligned with the boundary conditions or not. So I'm going to look at mu in the box of size n at inverse temperature beta with boundary condition one and I look at whether sigma zero is aligned with one or not. I take the scalar product with one. Okay, so this is just, it's the average spin at zero, except that because I'm in R new, average spin doesn't really, so I'm gonna just take it, say how much it's aligned with one. Okay, so for the, for the easing model, it's just sigma zero. Right? Now I want to know how much it's impacted by n, by the, how far are the boundary condition. So I'm going to send the boundary condition to infinity and see whether this quantity is positive or not. That's going to be my question. So the only problem here is that I have no clue at the moment how to prove that this thing converges when n tends to infinity. So I'm going to take the limit. Let's not be uh, too... Uh, and you are going to see that, in fact, proving that there is a limit already is an interesting question. And there are many models for the ON model. We have no clue how to do it. There is a second quantity, which is, OK, let's assume this thing tends to 0. So somehow you lose track of the symmetry. You are back to something. I mean, you lose track of the symmetry breaking. You are back to something symmetric. You can still ask at which speed you tend to this. So you could, for instance, define the following quantity, which is maybe it tends exponentially fast to zero. So let's define minus one over n log of mu one lambda n beta of sigma zero one. Okay? Is this thing, so let's call it tau of beta, is this thing tending to zero or not? If it doesn't tend to zero, it tells me that this thing is in fact tending to zero exponentially fast. 
If it tends to zero, it means that the convergence, maybe it doesn't tend to, uh, this thing doesn't even go to zero, but if it does go to zero, it will, at, it will never be exponentially fast. And once again, I have a problem that I'm not sure it converges, so let's take the limit. So now I can define two quantities. I can define beta c to be just the infimum of the beta such that m star of beta is positive. And I can define beta c tilde to be the supremum of the beta such that tau beta is positive. These two things are well defined. And observe the following thing. Whatever the model, so there is 0, the beta c tilde will be always smaller than beta c. And what you will get is that here you will get m star of beta positive, And here you will get exponential decay of mu lambda n beta 1 of sigma 0, 1. OK? So there is a priori three regimes, which is going to be this quantity doesn't tend to 0 at all. This quantity tends to 0, but not exponentially fast. This quantity tends to 0 exponentially fast. There are a priori three regimes. And these are the phase transition in my model. There are many other phase transitions, but that's the one that I'm going to study. OK? So beta c and beta c tilde are called critical points. And you can imagine that there are several things. Uh, maybe I should have been a little bit careful, sorry. Here, in fact, it's not even clear that this thing is positive, because I'm telling you, OK, is it positive or not? It's not even clear it's positive. So you can even, if you want, add to be really rigorous. Anyway, I'm not, once again, I told you here, I'm not going to prove anything in this chapter. I'm just trying to give, convey an idea. So you can even add absolute values to be certain that this thing is, that you can take the log. We prefer to take log of positive things, right? OK. Yes. So what is M star supposed to mean? So, so it's, it is somehow the average alignment of a spin with one. So think of the, it's the average spin. The only problem is that the spin a priori, uh, if it's using modern, is just the average spin. Problem is that in higher dimension, you have the whole, I mean, you have the whole thing. So you want just to say, OK. I'm going to just look how much it's aligned with one direction. I'm projecting it with the direction one, and I'm looking at this average. OK, the, just, just one thing. Uh, the conjecture here is that first, these quantities are positive. whatever the model, basically, as long as it's ferromagnetic. Remember that I'm focusing on that. And also, uh, the limit exists. The limit exists. In fact, you ask, I mean, we think that this thing is decreasing. And decreasing. In n. So the farther the boundary condition, the smaller the alignment with 1 the more symmetric you look. This is a very natural thing to expect. OK. Well, we are getting almost to the big uh, picture. So what are the possible scenarios there? What can happen? First thing that uh, can happen is that just beta c tilde and beta c are infinity. Yeah? So possible I don't know. 
beta c equal beta c tilde equal infinity. But in this context, what we are saying is that anyway, this quantity is always decaying exponentially fast. So then we say there is no phase transition. So this is no phase transition. Pt will be phase transition. If you could have that beta c is equal to infinity, but beta c tilde is not. So that would mean that there is never order. So this phase is called the order phase. Because you remember the symmetry breaking, even if you send the boundary condition to infinity. So in this case, you are saying there is never order. But there is still a phase transition in the sense that up to a certain temperature, you decay exponentially fast. And then you decay, in fact, sub-exponentially. What we expect in this case is algebraically, like a power. So here, this is called a, a costally tauless phase transition. And I never remember how you write it. OK. And Berezinski also. So it's a Berezinski costalis. And tauless phase transition. The problem is that I always call it BKT. Then I don't remember how to write it. And the name is due to the fact that this guy is actually, I'm going to mention it later on, but this guy predicted this type of phase transition for the XY model in dimension two. I'm going to go back to that. So BKT phase transition. The other possibility is that beta c tilde and beta c are smaller than infinity, and that in addition they are equal. So that means what? That means that you have exponential decay up to a certain point, and then you have an order. You pass directly from exponential decay to order. So this is called a sharp order disorder phase transition. And um, in this context, there is a very natural question that you want to ask is what is happening at this critical point, at this beta c, which is now common to beta c tilde and beta c. So there, what can happen is the following. So at beta c, you can ask. So now imagine the two guys are the same point. Is beta c belonging to the ordered phase or not? I don't know. You know, it's just the infimum. So I know that I'm ordered for any beta strictly larger, but what is happening at beta critical? And there are two possibilities. So either m star of beta c is positive. And in this case, we, we speak of the first, I mean, discontinuous phase transition. I mean, order disorder phase transition. Or m star of beta c is going to be equal to 0. And then it will be a continuous phase order disorder phase transition. Sometimes you will hear first order or second order phase transition, but actually it's not exactly the same. So let's stick to discontinuous and continuous phase transition. Example of discontinuous and continuous phase transitions are the following. If you take water, it has a discontinuous phase transition at zero when it becomes ice. There is coexistence of water and ice when it, it cooled down because it's possible at zero, exactly zero, to have uh, ice. When you, go for, when you go up to 100 degrees, at 100 degrees, you have, I mean, it's a continuous phase transition. You, cannot, you don't have coexistence of water and, uh, and um, vapor. Continuous. You don't have, you don't have um, a coexistence. So these are two examples. Just a remark. 
and we are going to see real examples in our, I mean, unreal or <laughs> for our models. Just one remark is that there is another possibility, which is much more rare, in fact, which is this one. You could have the three phases. And in fact, the clock model has this. So the clock model, so the planar clock model with Q much larger than one has this, uh, this behavior. So that's why I mentioned this clock model. And that's going to be the only model that we are going to mention which has this thing. We are, I'm not going to prove it, but well, at least you have an example. OK, let's make a big table. So he, yes? Sorry. Why can't it be um, discontinuous when the magnetization of the critical temperature is zero? No, then it, you will call it a continuous first transition. Is it, uh, but is it, is it really continuous? Like yeah, it's continuous from above, yes, yes. That's a good question, but in all the models that we are going to study, M beta, M star of beta is right continuous. That's a very good question, and it's a very important feature, uh, but it's always going to be the case, yes. Good question. Okay, so take a lot of room. So it's d equal 1. So this is using uh, weight maybe that I draw the difference. So pots. d equal 2. <coughs> d equal 3. Center it a little bit more. So it goes like that. Then it goes like it's a little bit. This is. Pots, Q equals 3 or 4, Q larger or equal to 5, and then you get the ON model. <coughs> ON, N equal 2, N larger or equal to 3. It does like that, like that. If you suffer, I can tell you that I had to redraw this thing a hundred times, so. Okay, and then it goes like that, like that, and like that. Okay, now you can draw. What happens for all these models? So dimension one, no phase transition. For any of these models, you have beta c tilde equal beta c equal infinity. Never ordering, never more than exponential decay. And I should say this is trivial, or basically trivial in dimension one. But here, you see I'm saying n larger or equal to 3, on model, so in particular Eisenberg model in dimension two, no phase transition. And this is a very, very important conjecture by Polyakov. Dating back to 1955. And once again, as I said, the n equals 3 model, the Heisenberg model, is related to Anderson localization. And this is exactly saying dimension 2, you have Anderson localization for your things. So this is a huge conjecture, a very, very important one. We don't know how to do. We are stuck. So we need your help. Then, in fact, for the n equal 2, so this is the xy model in dimension 2, you can prove that there is a Berenstiki uh, kosterlitz tauless phase transition. You can prove that. And this goes back to Frolich and Spencer. In 81. And the way they proved that was one of the milestones in, in statistical physics. They used uh, reflection positivity, and that was extremely important for what uh, went next. We are going to use at some point uh, reflection positivity. Here, the conjecture, so um, I'm going to, maybe I should say, OK. I'm going to put it in uh, like that and when it's actually proved. So here, 
there is a sharp and order disorder phase transition. So we know it's, uh, there is an order disorder phase transition, but the sharpness we don't know how to prove. So we know that beta c is smaller than infinity. We don't know how to prove that beta c tilde is equal to beta c. And this is once by Frölich. Simon and Spencer in 76, I think. Yes. Good. Now, let's go back. So this was for the continuum spin, right? Let's go back uh, to the discrete one for the pots and easing. So here, there is a continuous Order, disorder, phase, transition, and sharp. And as you can see, this now is all in white. Good for us. Um, I'm not going to tell you all the guys who were involved there. Because simply we are going to prove all these things during the, the term. So this we are going to do all of it. Yes. Why it's not proved? Oh. Ah. <laughs> yeah, that was a bad idea. Thank you. So it's in yellow. Uh, no, that's orange. Continuous, sharp, order, disorder, first transition. Everything is proved. All the names will. Uh, yes. Sorry. What do you mean by not sharp order, disorder? I don't hear? Yes. No, I just mean that sharpness is not proved. It is sharp, but uh, we don't know how to prove it. It's a conjecture. And what is already proved? That there is an order disorder phase transition. That beta c is smaller than infinity. Okay. Yeah. So here are the names, for instance, for the easing model in dimension 2. Onzager proved that, the, I mean, first, Peirce proved in, in 39, something, or 36 that, in fact, the easing model always have a phase transition, whatever the dimension. This Peirce argument was also used here for the POTS model. Um, so the, this is order disorder. The sharpness, I mean, the, the sharpness of the phase transition was proved in dimension two by Jan Zager first with the continuity. And uh, was then uh, the sharpness was proved in dimension three and more by Eisenman and Barsky. Then um, the continuity was proved in dimension three and higher by Eisenman, myself, and uh, Sidoravicius. And <coughs> the pots with three and four states here, the sharpness was proved by myself and Befara, and the continuity was proved by myself, Tassion, and Sidoravicius. Dimension, I mean, Q larger or equal to five, here what you expect is to have a discontinuous sharp and order disorder phase transition. And the only thing that is known here is that here is sharp. And that for large, for Q, much, much larger than one, all these things are true. So I will go back to the precise name later on. So you see, I mean, there, there, there are things that are interesting there. So first, even for the same model, the number of colors matter. It matters a lot. So you can have completely different behavior. The easing model is continuous, but in fact, if you get above five uh, colors, you get something continuous, discontinuous, sorry. What is even more surprising somehow is that the dimension matters even more. No, for three and four colors, here you have a continuous phase transition, here you have a discontinuous one. Something a little bit strange, and that's something that, we are gonna, that I'm gonna discuss over the term, that even though I'm not gonna treat this case, but is that model of statistical physics, when you change the dimension at some level, you are gonna get to what we call the upper critical dimension, above which you have a a model which is in the, sa the same as on what we call mean feed behavior. 
So on a tree or on a complete graph or something like that. And this is basically the upper critical dimension for this model. This is the upper critical dimension for this model. The upper critical dimension depends on the model. OK? Um, here, that may be one of the biggest conjecture in statistical physics. Actually, here, I'm cheating a little bit. The order disorder was proved only for the quantum version of it. So this is also a very important con conjecture. And um, I guess I, you see that they are very, very different behavior. And one thing that I want to uh, argue is that here, in the continuous regime, you can ask what is happening at beta critical. And what is going to happen is that in this regime here, you are going to have conformal invariance, in fact. So this is something I'm going to discuss. When you take the scale, what we call the scaling limit, imagine you look at your model from farther and farther away, you get something which is going to be conformal invariant. And this is related to conformal field theory, which maybe will be mentioned in the class of Marino. Here, you also have a way of taking the scaling limit. And depending on the dimension, you are going to get something different. For d large or equal to 4, you are going to get this trivial theory that I was mentioning that I will describe in more details later in the class. And here, the dimension 3, which is a relevant dimension from the point of view of the Ising model, here we don't know. It's a non-trivial theory, but the conformal invariance seems completely out of reach. And this is a beautiful question to actually try to describe the critical behavior here. And this is also one of the main conjecture in uh, main open problem in statistical physics. So we are touching through a few examples in this class. We are going to touch actually very, very important and, and fundamental problems. And um, well, I hope I would manage to make it at least a little bit exciting. I know that it's exactly uh, time, but since there is no uh, TA and I just have half a page to finish this ch chapter, maybe you give me 15 more minutes and uh, I will not be very long, don't worry. And like that, we can really start next week percolation and uh, have a little bit of fun with proofs. Do you have questions on these things? No? Perfect. So, just to tell you a little bit the punchline of the whole thing here, of the whole class, is that you can define a completely different type of model, which is called a percolation model. So, small four. Percolation model and geometric representation. So what is a percolation model? So definition, take G a subgraph of ZD and let omega, omega E, E so are the edges of, of, um, of G, an element of 0, 1 to the edges of G. So it's a function from the edges to 0, 1. And this function is just telling you if omega e is equal to 1, we say, I mean, it's a way of saying the edge is open. And if omega e is equal to 0, the edge is closed. OK, so it's just a, fun, I mean, a configuration. It's just a, I mean, a set. I mean, just saying that every edge of your graph is either open or closed. It's saying whether it's open or closed. And one thing is that you can see omega can be seen. So this is the definition. So one important point is that omega can be seen as a subgraph of G simply by saying that omega is given, I mean, the set of vertices of omega is just a set of vertices of G. 
And the set of edges of omega is just the set of edges in G such that omega is 1. So it's a set of open edges. OK? So any configuration can be seen as a subgraph of G. And a percolation model is simply a probability measure on percolation configuration. Uh, so this is called, uh, is called, sorry, a percolation configuration. So definition, a percolation model. So it's a little bit vague, but we are going to give precise examples. So percolation model is a family, PG, G included in ZD. So for every graph of ZD, I give myself a percolation measure, where PG is a probability measure on, um, on percolation configuration on G. OK? So this is simply, I mean, it's a vague thing, but you are going to see we are going to give examples anyway. Percolation model is just I give myself percolation, I mean, probability measures on percolation configurations. And here, I mean, what are we interested in? We see the, confi the percolation configuration, our subgraph of the original graph. So we can look at just connectivity properties of this percolation, uh, this subgraph, this random subgraph. So we are going to be interested in in the connectivity properties of omega, of the random subgraph. So let me just give you a few notations like that we are done for the whole semester. So we are going to say that the, so def, the, or notation rather, the maximal connected components of omega. So there is a notion of connectivity, which is just I can pass by edges from one point to another one. So a maximal connected component of omega is called the cluster. That's the first notation. Second is we say that x and y are connected in S, included in G, if there exists a sequence x equal v0, then v1 vk equal y. So a sequence of neighboring vertices such that two things. Sorry, I'm accelerating a little bit, but I don't want to keep you here too much over time. So such as two things, vi is in S for every i. So I'm, I have a sequence of vertices in S. And the second property is that omega of vi, vi plus 1, is 1 for every i. So I have a sequence of vertices which are connected by open edges going from x to y in S. And this thing, we are going to call it, we are going to denote so it. Y, X and Y are also in S. Sorry? X and Y are also in S? Or? Yeah. So necessarily, they must be in S. Otherwise, the thing doesn't happen, yes. But I, I could ask anyway, just that the thing is not going to happen. So this is how we will denote this event. OK? Same thing, we are going to say that A is connected to B in S if 
there exists x in A and there exists y in B such that x is connected in S to y. Okay, so you can do it for set of vertices. And actually, we are going to even allow B equal infinity. And even A connected in S to infinity, if there exists x in A, and as, well, you, well, maybe you see what I mean. Connected to infinity in S. Meaning that then you have an infinite sequence of vertices, of disjoint vertices. So these are the notations. And I should also me, I mean, say that if S is equal to G, I'm going to just drop it, right? I'm just going to say X and Y are connected. OK. Now, just the punchline is what? What is the geometric representation So definition, if I give myself a Gibbs measure of any type and a percolation measure, PG, such that for every xy in G, you have that mu G beta so let's say I look at what we call the correlation. So we, I look at how much sigma x and sigma y are aligned. If this thing is equal to the probability that x is connected to y, then we say that PG is the percolation model, is a geometric representation of the spin model. Then <coughs> PG is a geometric representation of mu g b. And sometimes it's going to be a little bit different. Sometimes you are going to just, OK, so that's the definition. Another way of looking at it sometimes is going to be that if I take mu g beta and I take one, so let's take three boundary conditions here, maybe. I should have said what was the boundary condition. If I take one boundary condition and I look at sigma x and I look at how much I'm aligned with one, sometimes it's going to be what you want to say is that it's like this thing, x related, I mean x connected to the boundary of g. This is also when we will have this type of relation, but in fact they will always come together, but whatever. If you have this type of thing, you also say that it's a geometric representation. There's no dependency on the beta on the right on the beta. It's just, yeah, I could have added beta here. I mean, in general, for every beta and every model, there's going to be a, a, a geometric representation. And the measure, the random measure, I mean, no, it's not a random measure. The measure is going to depend on beta. The random subgraph is going to depend. The percolation model depends on G, beta, and the model that you are looking at, and sometimes even the boundary condition that you are looking at. What is nice here is that you translated something purely analytical, you know, the spin, spin, I mean, how much these guys are aligned, in terms of something very visual, if you think about it. I mean, whether this guy is connected to this guy in some kind of random subgraph. And this theory of random subgraphs, you are going to see there are many inequalities that you can use there. The, the approach, the analytical approach, one of the downsides, I mean, it's very powerful, but one of the downsides is that as soon as you start using inequalities, you, get, you are doomed, basically. And here, you are going to see we will have correlation inequalities, the FKG inequality, things like that, that are very uh, powerful and that allow to study these models much better than the others. In particular, we will be able to prove that this mu lambda n beta is decreasing, that, I mean, the, in terms of when you look at the spin-spin correlation and things like that. This is going to be easy with these models. OK, but it doesn't mean, so and notice here, for instance, that then when g tends to infinity, you, look, you are looking here at the, man, I mean, the spontaneous magnetization, right? The order parameter. And here it's going to be related to whether x is connected to infinity or not. 
in your uh, model. Well, the model always changed, but you're going to see we'll make sense of that. So it's the percolation properties of your model are directly related to the order disorder properties of your uh, spin model. So there is a direct connection like that. OK, so what do we do next week? Well, I mean, this is good only if the percolation model is easier to study than the, the spin model, right? Otherwise, uh, it's completely useless. So we are going to start next week by studying one model, which is very simple of percolation, which is basically when you take edges to be open independently. This is percolation. Even for those who came last year, you can come, or two or three years ago, you can come to this class. I'm going to do it in a much faster way. And the geodesic way, it's going to be nice. The downside is that this percolation model is not the geometric representation of any uh, interesting spin model. So then, in the next classes, we will actually have to develop a theory of percolation model with dependency, basically, which are more difficult, but more interesting also. OK, see you next week. And there are um, the exercises.